This is what happens when you work to change things. And first they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Notorious scammer Elizabeth Holmes was once the youngest self-made female billionaire. Then, in the blink of an eye, her company was worthless and she lost it all, being heralded as quote, the next Steve Jobs, to now finding herself facing serious criminal charges and decades in prison. Elizabeth Holmes was considered a hero, but when investors started to catch on that she built her empire almost entirely based on a lie. That lie found Elizabeth guilty of 4 out of 11 charges of fraud, wherein she could face up to 20 years in prison when she is officially sentenced. And now, the Hulu series The Dropout, based on a podcast detailing the case, is widely spreading Holmes' lies and deception, giving it more publicity than ever. Elizabeth Holmes was born to be a fraudster. Her own dad went bankrupt after being accused of an accounting fraud scandal where they, using accounting loopholes, hid billions of dollars in debt from failed projects and dealings. Elizabeth came from some seriously old money. Her third great-grandfather founded the world's biggest yeast production company, and both her parents were involved in congressional politics and international trade. Holmes herself was creating and selling program-based businesses while she was still in high school. She learned how to speak Mandarin Chinese, and only partway through high school did she already begin attending Stanford University's summer Mandarin program. When she graduated high school, she attended Stanford where she studied chemical engineering and worked as a student researcher and lab assistant in the School of Engineering, all within her freshman year. Her interests lay in laboratory research and medical engineering, and by the end of her freshman year, she was studying SARS. This laboratory research involving SARS sparked an interest in collection of blood samples through the use of syringes. She filed her first patent for an invention she had created, which was a wearable drug delivery patch, and a year later, she took the plunge and decided to drop out of university and use her tuition money to fund her consumer healthcare technology company. The name of this company was Real Time Cures, set to quote, democratize healthcare. The beginning of her company, she would later state, was inspired by her fear of needles, wherein she became interested in performing forming blood tests using only a minute amount of blood. When she first proposed the idea to a professor at Stanford, he said it was impossible, but she eventually convinced him to back her idea. She later renamed the company Theranos, a combo of the words therapy and diagnosis. A year after the creation of the company, it had raised $6 million in funding before even releasing a product or prototype. By the end of 2010, she had $92 million. By the end of 2014, Theranos was valued at $9 billion and had raised more than four hundred million dollars in venture capital. Elizabeth was on top of the world. She featured on Forbes magazine as the world's youngest female self-made billionaire, and she featured on the Forbes 400. She was praised for, quote, this phenomenal rebooting of laboratory medicine for her revolutionary idea of only using a few drops of blood in lab testing. But that's exactly what it was, just an idea. In 2015, a Wall Street journalist was tipped off about the fishiness of the whole operation. A medical expert who thought the experiments were off asked him to speak to a few ex-employees who became eventually whistleblowers. It wouldn't be long, however, before Elizabeth found out about the probe into her company, and she decided to launch a campaign to stop the journalist from publishing his findings. She threatened him legally and financially, but despite her threats, the journalist published the piece. He detailed the company's experiments, how the prototype they were touting around gave extremely inaccurate results, and how the results they had been promoting that came from the prototype actually came from commercially available blood sample machines. Elizabeth Holmes denied all the accusations and called the Wall Street Journal a tabloid. She appeared on television the night that article was posted and stated, quote, This is what happens when you work to change things. First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Then the trouble really started for Holmes. In 2016, a few months after the article was published, Elizabeth was caught operating a lab that had faulty equipment and used unsafe procedures. The findings meant that she was banned for two years from owning, operating, or directing a blood testing service. Although Theranos appealed the decision, Walgreens terminated their relationship with the company, and the FDA ordered the company to cease making its blood collecting device because it was both dangerous and didn't work. Then the lawsuits started cropping up. Elizabeth's company was ordered to repay all the consumers who bought all of her products in the state of Arizona under false pretenses that they actually worked. She ended up having to shell out $4.65 million to Arizona alone. 99% of Theranos shareholders basically partially backed out, and in 2018, both Holmes and her former president, Ramesh Balwani, were officially charged with fraud. Now, something to know about Ramesh. 
Her and Elizabeth had an epic love affair. He is 20 years her senior, and the two had met while she was in college at Stanford. Their relationship was super toxic, however, and Balwani was known as a bully around the office, often tracking his employees' whereabouts and outing them if he deemed them to be too unproductive. Eventually, he and Elizabeth broke up in 2016 when the company was starting to downturn and got into legal trouble, and she pushed him out of the presidential position. A lot of people, once the case had garnered insane media attention, were shocked as to why it had been allowed to go on for so long. A lot of it had to do with how obsessed Elizabeth was with security. She had security guards stay with each visitor throughout the entire time that they were in the Theranos building, and they even reportedly escorted them to bathrooms. She also only signed deals with companies on the condition that they absolutely do not reveal any information about the deal with anyone else. That means that she got to rack up an insane amount of money because companies weren't talking to each other about how much they were giving Elizabeth. So by 2018, Elizabeth and Balwani, along with the company as a whole, were charged with massive fraud by the SEC, and she had to agree to give up financial and voting control of the company, pay $500,000, and return almost 20 million shares of Theranos stock. She also isn't allowed to be a director of any publicly traded company for a whole decade. Despite all this, she stayed CEO of Theranos because it's a private company, but only a few months later, she would step down as CEO on the same day that she and Balwani were charged with nine counts of wire fraud and two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. All while her company is burning around her, Elizabeth is on social media touting her new boyfriend and new puppy. She's now dating the heir to a fancy hospitality company. And author Nick Bilton posted about it on Twitter stating, quote, I personally find it crazy that she's being charged with 11 felony counts, thousands of people's lives were harmed, and she's as happy as can be. Now, after being charged in January and facing up to 20 years in prison, we're not sure when she'll be officially sentenced but it seems pretty likely that she'll face some amount of jail time, at least if just to prove a point. Her and her boyfriend, Will Evans, used to live in a $5,000 a month apartment in San Francisco. Although no one's sure where they live now, I can't imagine it's going to be a normal apartment. It's been reported that she and her boyfriend got married in 2019, but no one's really sure because the wedding was allegedly super private, which is very on brand for Elizabeth. Her trials only took so long too because of the worldwide thingy that happened in 2020. Otherwise, she would have been sentenced way sooner, given how serious fraud charges are taken in the US. And in 2021, Elizabeth also gave birth to a baby with her boyfriend, so there's that too, I guess. So as it stands now, she's facing 20 years in prison, a fine of $250,000, and is required to possibly pay each and every one of her victims restitution, which could add up to millions of dollars. But we won't know what her actual penalty will be yet until the sentencing, which hasn't been set. We have been working on something that we are very excited to share with you and something that we believe is magical uh, that's going to improve the quality of care. Ramesh Balwani, known more commonly according to his nickname Sonny, is the former president and COO of Theranos, who founded the company with his then-girlfriend Elizabeth Holmes. The company was built on a lie with the promise to revolutionize science. Starting in 2015, Theranos came under intense media criticism due to its questionable claims and practices. Eventually, they were ruined with both Sonny and Elizabeth charged by the FBI for operating the business as a Ponzi scheme to defraud investors and patients. And now, the trial against Sonny that will likely see him in jail is underway. Ramesh was born in Pakistan before they moved to India due to religious persecution. Eventually, however, However, he and his family moved to the United States, where Sonny finished high school and entered into university in Austin, Texas. He began working for companies like Microsoft in the 90s and created a software development company that was purchased by a different company. This purchasing gave him $6 million in stock, which he held onto until he sold them for a cool $40 million, effectively making Sonny an extremely wealthy man. After he did so, he went back to school and got a master's degree in business at UC Berkeley in 2003. While at Berkeley, he met Elizabeth Holmes at the time, who was 18 years old and in her senior year of high school. She pursued an undergraduate degree at Stanford in chemical engineering, but didn't complete it, instead choosing to drop out to focus on her new company, Theranos, full time. A year after she started the company, Sunny joined and ran the day-to-day -day operations as its president. Although the company was a biomedical one, he had no training in biological sciences or medical devices. This became an issue due to the absence of medical experts on the company's board of directors. The company itself is a blood testing corporation, so not having any doctors on board made it difficult. 
Additionally, Sonny's behavior while working became infamous as he was extremely difficult to work with. He created such a toxic work environment that he became described by former Theranos employees as overbearing, uncompromising, and so concerned about industrial espionage that he verged on paranoia. Sonny became known as someone who used technical terms he didn't understand to appear more knowledgeable about medical science than he actually was. At one point, he misheard the term end effector, which is basically the claw device at the end of a machine, and he thought it was actually called endo factor, which isn't a word. He repeated the error and used it as a term throughout meetings and didn't notice when an employee used the word endo factor instead of end effector to make fun of him during their PowerPoint presentation. Then a Wall Street journalist decided to do some extra digging and using a whistleblower in October 2015, he found that the blood testing device that the company had touted as a miracle scientific marvel provided inaccurate medical diagnosis and results. The machine frequently failed quality control checks and provided widely varying results, a finding that was corroborated in a report released in March 2016 by a federal science industry. In 2016, Theranos told regulators it had voided all test results from the machines from 2014 and 2015, as well as some other tests it ran on conventional machines. The Wall Street Journal article that exposed the company also found that the company was lying to patients and was more often than not using a traditional blood testing machine that was already commercially available rather than the one that they had created. In 2016, as the company was starting to crash and burn under the weight of the expose article, Elizabeth and Sonny were sent a warning letter after the CMS, basically the feds of lab safety, found that their lab in California was operating a horribly illegal blood testing lab. They also slapped Sonny specifically with a two year ban from owning or operating a blood lab after he refused to fix the problems related to the lab itself. They also decided to charge Theranos with fraud because they claimed that the US Department Department of Defense used their company's technology despite that just being a blatant lie. They also claimed to having a revenue stream of an estimated $100 million despite only making a total of $100,000 the year it was published in 2014. So in 2018, Sonny and Elizabeth were charged by the SEC with securities fraud for quote, raising more than $700 million from investors through an elaborate years long fraud in which they exaggerated or made false statements about the company's technology, business, and financial performance. Elizabeth decided to settle the case out of court without admitting or denying wrongdoing, but Sonny was still in litigation in 2019, following an investigation by the US Attorney's Office in San Francisco that lasted more than two years. A federal grand jury indicated President Ramesh Balwani and Elizabeth Holmes on nine counts of wire fraud and two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. Prosecutors alleged that Holmes and Balwani engaged in two criminal schemes, one to defraud investors and another to defraud patients. In March 2020, they decided that Sonny will try separately from Elizabeth, who in January of this year was found guilty of multiple counts of fraud. Sonny's trial began in March of this year with jury selection, but it keeps getting delayed. More on that later. As for his love life, Sonny interestingly used to be married to a Japanese artist before they got divorced in 2002. He was still married to her when he met Elizabeth in university, who was 18 years old and 19 years younger than him. He and her began dating when Sonny got divorced, although they didn't disclose their romantic relationship when he was brought onto Theranos as a president. During her trial, Elizabeth claims that she sought comfort in Sonny after someone came onto her without her consent. Their relationship lasted more than a decade. Elizabeth claims that he was a very controlling person and he would regularly harm her throughout their relationship. Despite this testimony, she also stated that he had, quote, not forced her to make false statements to investors, business partners, journalists, and company directors that had been described in the case. Case. Although Sonny has denied the claims that he hurt Elizabeth and he has accused her of slander and being inflammatory. Now back onto what's happening in the trial. As it stands literally right now, literally in the days we are currently in, we'll be deciding what happens to Sonny. Elizabeth was found guilty of fraud, but because Sonny is being tried separately, his was delayed to around now because of illness and having difficulty finding a proper jury. His defense so far was that he made no profit off of Theranos and so had no say in the fraud that took 
took place. But as was revealed yesterday at the time of writing this, jurors reportedly saw texts from Sonny to Elizabeth that stated, quote, I am responsible for everything at Theranos, which basically runs exactly contrary to the defense that he was merely an investor in the company and not the literal chief of operations. Sonny is charged with 10 counts of wire fraud and two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. He's pleaded not guilty to all 12 counts. As of right now, it's still unclear whether or not Elizabeth will testify at Sonny's trial, but if she does, we can't expect her to give any positive testimonies considering how hateful she is towards him now. And while Sonny faces decades in prison if he is convicted of fraud, he isn't currently in prison, nor is he in police custody. While Elizabeth has moved on from Sonny and is currently pregnant with her first baby with her new husband, which girl, you move on way too fast, it seems that Sonny has no interest in doing the same. He and Elizabeth sold their mansion in California that they owned together for $15.8 million just last month. Either way, as the trial is still ongoing, there really isn't much I'm able to say, mostly because there isn't much being released. In such a high profile case, it's unlikely that they'll release tons of details and evidence to the public while the judgment is still ongoing. I'd say once he is sentenced, which he definitely will be, that's when there will be more information to dissect about what exactly is going on in the courtroom. I predict that he will be found guilty and that Elizabeth will testify, but that's just my two cents. Probably the biggest thing is trust the people you hire. So that's one thing I thought Theranos did really well was hiring, but it seemed like they didn't, the management didn't listen to the brilliant scientists that they actually hired. The television series The Dropout has chronicled the fascinating and wild story of Elizabeth Holmes and her defunct company Theranos. I feel like if you're watching this video, you've definitely seen the others that we've done on it, so I'll definitely just be kind of skimming the fraud thing and speaking more about Tyler Schultz, the whistleblower who started the takedown of the entire company. He's the man who went to the Wall Street Journal with the whole story, and the person who provided enough evidence to possibly land both Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani in prison for fraud. Now the owner and operator of a biomedical science company himself, we catch up and see just what Tyler Schultz is thinking as the Theranos trials take place. Not much is known about Tyler's early life, and honestly, who really cares? What we care more about is his ascent into the Theranos company and how he obtained the information that would take the company down. A little briefing on what Theranos actually is. It was a private company that touted itself as a marvel that breakthroughs health technology. The company claimed to have tech that could administer blood tests using just a few drops of blood rather than a standard full vial. These claims were unfounded and they conned a bunch of investors into donating millions of dollars for a company that had a product that was extremely faulty with unreliable results. In fact, Theranos would lie about the tests being done on their machine and sometimes they used commercial machines to administer blood tests. After the news broke and the company faced a string of legal and financial issues, it was estimated that Elizabeth Holmes' net worth dropped from $4.5 billion to virtually nothing. Tyler Schultz is the grandson of George Schultz, a Theranos board member and the former Secretary of State for President Ronald Reagan. Tyler himself worked for the company and was extremely close with his grandfather. But while in the labs, Tyler noticed that the Theranos equipment, dubbed Edison machines, frequently failed quality control checks and produced widely varying results. This was extremely dangerous for medical patients who relied on accurate information for test results, from cancer diagnosis to whether or not to require surgery. He had originally met Elizabeth Holmes in 2011 while he was visiting his grandfather. Tyler describes that he, quote, fell in love with her vision of instant and painless blood tests. After he got his degree in chemical engineering, Tyler interned at the company, then was hired on full time. Tyler specifically was hired on to be quality assurance for test results and so would run blood samples a few times to make sure that the results were accurate. One such result tipped him off when it was claimed that an STD was able to be detected with 95% accuracy. When Tyler ran the blood through again, he found that accuracy was much closer to 65%. That meant that if 100 people infected with the disease were tested only with the Edison machine, as many as 35 of them would likely incorrectly conclude that they were disease free. He also noticed that the Edison machines were continually flunking quality control standards. He also said that the notoriously rough-handed Sonny Balwani had pressured the lab employees to ignore the failures and run blood tests on the machine anyways contrary to accepted lab practices. So he sent a concerned email directly to Elizabeth Holmes, who did not respond. Instead, Sonny replied, quote, we saw your email to Elizabeth. 
Before I get into specifics, let me share with you that had this email come from anyone else in the company, I would have already held them accountable for the arrogant and patronizing tone and reckless comments. Tyler also stated that he would have been fired had it not been for his grandfather. So he quit. As he was leaving the office, he got a concerned call from his mother, who told him to stop whatever he was about to do because Sonny had called and threatened her, stating that whatever Tyler did would be met with the harshest extent of the law. Tyler then went directly to his grandfather, who effectively brushed him off. The Theranos board member and Tyler's own grandfather said that the blood testing machines worked so well that they were being used in military hospitals. Tyler knew that that was a lie. His grandfather then attempted to pressure him into signing a confidentiality agreement after they found out that Tyler had spoken to a reporter. He continually was pressured to sign non-disclosure agreements which would effectively silence him forever. He kept refusing and learned that he was being followed by private investigators. His parents pleaded with him to sign the form or they would have to sell the house to cover legal fees. That being said, they later stated, quote, Tyler had acted exactly like the man we raised him to be, and we are extraordinarily proud of him. Then in 2015, the article was published and all contact with NDAs had ceased. Now though, as the trials occur and Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani are facing the fullest extent of the law for their actions, Tyler opened up once more about how things had been since the television series, The Dropout, aired. Tyler now works for a biotechnology company and is collaborating with a team of researchers to try and build a portable device that would be capable of diagnosing a dozen diseases from a person's blood, saliva, and vital signs. He also recalls meeting with his grandfather before the trials began. They hadn't spoken in seven months. He said he told his grandfather how he was so disappointed in the lack of support from him throughout the entire ordeal. When describing his emotions during the Elizabeth Holmes trial, quote, I decided to deal with it by playing my guitar super loud. I probably disturbed my neighbors. I had a lot of nervous energy. And I can totally understand why. He blew the whistle on the company when he was only 22 years old. And now being 31, this has been building for quite some time. Although he was at work during the last trial, he recalls his phone buzzing with a message from his wife. Quote, it was a text in all caps, guilty. All of a sudden, it was just a weight was lifted. It's over, I can't believe it's over. After that, he and his family decided it was worth a toast, so they popped some champagne together to celebrate. Although Tyler wasn't the only whistleblower, he was the first to report to others about the irregular findings to regulators. When speaking to his grandfather before Elizabeth's trial went down, Tyler recalls stating, quote, I am pleading with you as your grandson, please do the right thing. He begged his grandfather to distance himself from Theranos publicly. Although George isn't on the board of directors anymore after the company ceased production, he is on the board of counselors. In response to Tyler's pleas, he was non-committal. He remained on the board of counselors and the two hadn't seen or spoken to each other since that meeting. So far during the trials, Tyler has not yet been asked to testify against Elizabeth Holmes. Although now that Sonny's trial is underway, I feel like they may very well ask him to testify there given the emails coming directly from him. He and his parents, obviously not including his grandfather, celebrated when Elizabeth went down for her crimes and was convicted of fraud. She is currently awaiting a sentence for a guilty verdict and could face up to 20 years in prison. Similarly, Sonny is currently awaiting his verdict and sentencing if found guilty, which let's be honest, he will be. It's been really great to see that Tyler's parents haven't abandoned him like his grandfather did. Although I totally understand their fear towards standing up to what once was a multi-billion dollar company, Tyler did the right thing. Currently, he is the CEO of his own biomedical science company that focuses on women's fertility issues. While he says he would never become another Elizabeth Holmes, he does concede that he is another startup founder who now better understands the high pressure context that might create someone like Holmes. In a very recent Economic Times article, like a couple days ago recent, Tyler also stated that although his grandfather never apologized to him, he did tell Tyler that he was right about Theranos all along. The two reconciled very briefly before George Schultz passed away in 2021. I guess in a way that can be closure enough for the family rift caused by the dubious ethics of Theranos. When people lie on their deathbed, I rarely expect that anyone will say, I wish I worked X more hours to generate Y more of revenue. Erica Chung is the perfect example of if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. 
She is a modern day hero who spoke out against the company that had attempted to bully her into submission through guerrilla style tactics. And now viewers get to see it all play out on the screen with the Hulu miniseries, The Dropout. She and two other whistleblowers were instrumental in the takedown of the fraudster Elizabeth Holmes, who collected millions of dollars in investors money on the promise of a machine that didn't work. And now we see what Erica has done since her time at Theranos and how she's reacting to the ongoing trials. She graduated from UC Berkeley with a dual degree in molecular cell biology and linguistics. She had gone to a career fair on campus and got a successful interview with a small company called Theranos. At the time of Erica's application, the company was just starting. So she was there from basically the inception and creation of the company. How Erica had been sold the concept of Theranos was that they had a machine called the Edison that only needed a single finger prick of blood rather than hooking a patient up to a needle and getting tubes of it for testing. The idea was revolutionary and could potentially open the door to tons of advancement in medical science. It also meant that if you had a device that allowed for more frequent and much less invasive diagnostics and testing, you could potentially catch something in patients that were in extremely beginning stages, saving countless lives. So Erica got the interview and was put on the team. She started out as a junior lab associate. She describes her first red flag within the company as being when she would sit in meetings reviewing data with her coworkers and higher ups. Her higher ups would request that they remove the outlier or a data point that wasn't like the rest to see if it helps accuracy ratings. In math, the outlier is often ignored, but when it comes to medical science, the outlier is a real patient rather than just a random number. The real patient's blood sample was off and they decided to ignore it to see if it would let the accuracy ratings go up. Another red flag was when Erica was testing patient blood samples for prostate cancer. She ran it on a commercially available testing machine and found that the patient had low risk. Then she ran a blood sample on the Edison machine and the results jumped up to having a high risk of prostate cancer. She ran it again on the Edison and it lowered to a concern. Then she ran it a third time and it was low risk. The numbers were all over the place and had no reliability whatsoever. While the idea of a patient receiving a false cancer diagnosis is heartbreaking, what's worse is if a patient receives a false negative. What if someone has an extremely high risk of prostate cancer, but the Edison tells them it's low? That person will then take that information and it could have potentially life-altering effects. When she took her concerns to Sonny Balwani, he told her off stating that she didn't know what she was talking about and that she should only be doing what they pay her to do, which is essentially to lie. So she met with Tyler Schultz, who was also becoming disillusioned with the way that the company was being run, and they went right to Tyler's grandfather, who was on the board of directors and the ex-secretary of state for the US. The elder Schultz basically said that while they both seemed smart and capable, much smarter and more capable people were telling him that this machine worked and would revolutionize healthcare. Erica quit the very next day. She went through a few weeks of a crisis where she felt like she may have been overreacting. I mean, everyone was telling her she was and Elizabeth Holmes was gracing every magazine cover like she was a hero. Then she got contacted by a journalist at the Wall Street Journal. While she was in the midst of speaking to him about her concerns, Theranos decided to go on a witch hunt to effectively silence all the former employees who, to them, were breaking non-disclosure agreements by sharing company secrets. Theranos intimidated Erica, threatening her and her family with legal ramifications if she not only talked to journalists, but also if she had any contact with other employees, both currently working and not. Private investigators were called to follow her. She was watched in her home, and so Erica called a lawyer who told her to report to a regulatory agency. She was so petrified about her physical safety that she begged the agency not to reveal her identity. Remember, she was 22 at this point, and this was her first professional career, so I completely understand that fear. So Erica was the one to tip off the scientific lab regulation company, which is basically the feds of scientific ethical practices and what was going on at Theranos, which is essentially the sole decision that took down the company. Her whistleblowing led the regulators to shut down Holmes's lab and prevent them from sending their blood test results to real patients. 
And so now, after she effectively saved lives, we catch up to just exactly where Erica Chung is now. In 2021, Erica testified against Elizabeth during her trial. She describes the constant bullying and the culture of silencing those who tried to speak up for their rights and to advocate for patients and reliable test results. Being that she was the one who instigated the takedown, she was called to provide proof of the private investigators sent to harass her. She also provided proof of the emails that were sent to her to effectively gaslight her into thinking that she didn't know what she was talking about. All while she held the data to show that, quote, the accuracy of the Edison machine was like a coin toss. Effectively, she basically personally handed Elizabeth Holmes the guilty sentence. As it stands now, Elizabeth hasn't been charged yet, but that's only a matter of time. Similarly with Sonny Balwani, because he was tried separately, his trial is still underway. We don't yet have a sentence for Sonny, but if Elizabeth's guilty status is any indication, I can pretty well say with some certainty that Sonny's will be as well. The two will also probably face jail time and heavy fines for duping billions of dollars out of investors for a machine that didn't really exist. They lied and schemed their way on a machine that barely worked. Additionally, I got most of the information for this video in a TED Talk that Erica conducted back in November 2020. She has dedicated years of her life to informing and advocating for employees who speak up if they witness something wrong within their company. She is the co-founder and CEO of Ethics and Entrepreneurship and describes herself as a quote, medical researcher turned technology and innovation ecosystem builder. Her work is dedicated to supporting whistleblowers within their own companies and protecting their legal rights. As her LinkedIn states, if Erica is emailed about someone concerned with going public about their issues with a company, she and her business will use their team of lawyers to make sure that no rules are broken under whistleblower regulation so the threat of a lawsuit is diminished. She also goes around the world giving talks about her experience with Theranos. She enunciates the need for employee rights and safety to speak up within a workplace. She asks a question of her audience, quote, what happens when the vision is so compelling and the desire to believe is so strong that it starts to cloud your judgment about what reality is? Oftentimes, projects like this do more harm than good because people are so hyper-focused on the goal and less on how to achieve it, which can lead to damage to the world at large. The mission statement of the company is, quote, to foster stronger cultures of people who speak up and listen to those who speak up. It's interesting what Erica did with her brief but impactful time at Theranos. And while very little, if any good, came out of Theranos itself, it would appear that Erica is doing her own great work. And now you can watch the real thing play out on Hulu through their miniseries, The Dropout, which documents basically the entire thing, from the inception of Theranos to its eventual downfall.